flexibility and centered thinking, once we get that mastered, it can really help us to take on a whole new level of problem solving. And in the concrete operational stage of the elementary years, ages seven to 11, this is really when we understand board games and we understand puzzles and we understand really complicated problem solving techniques. Some of these come on a little bit earlier than others. For instance, in a very classic study that's very similar to today's modern escape room games, there was this study called the Marble Run Study. And kids were told that there was a marble run in one room, but they, there was no marbles. And then there was marbles in another room. But they had to go get the key to the marble run room while also getting a container to carry the marbles from the marble room. And they had to plan out the steps. They had to figure out which one had to happen first. Did they get the key first and get the marble run? Or do they go and get the container to get the marbles, then get the key to get the marble run? And which would be the most sense to get to play marble? And so we can see that about the different steps. If you're thinking about an escape room and trying to get the key and unlock the puzzle and go here and go there, uh, kids around this age start to get those steps together. We can also see this in a couple other classic examples, such as the riverboat problem. And so the riverboat problem is there's a farmer with a boat and the boat can only fit one other object, but he has to cross the river with his sheep, his wolf and his cabbage. Now, if left alone on the bank of the river, the wolf will eat the sheep and the sheep will eat the cabbage. You can only really leave the wolf and the cabbage alone. And so you have to move all three of these objects across the river. Which do you move first and how does it work? This requires a lot of planning and a lot of reversibility and steps. We also have the classic example of the Tower of Hanoi. So in the Tower of Hanoi, there is a stack of discs on a peg, and it almost looks like a little pyramid with wider discs at the base and smaller discs at the top. And you have to move the entire pyramid onto another peg, but you can only move one disc at a time, and you can never put a larger disc on top of a smaller disc. You have three pegs to work with, including the peg they're currently all on, and you have to figure out what sequence of steps to do following the rules that will allow you to relocate the entire pyramid. As we get older and as we move even and more advanced into the formal operational thought period, not only can we do these riverboat problems in the Tower of Hanoi, we can get to more complicated things such as the pendulum problem. The pendulum problem is a classic study in which there is about like a T-shaped apparatus with a hook on it. And you can hook different lengths of string that can be tied to different weights. And the goal of the pendulum problem is to make a weight attached to the string swing the widest possible. So rather than having a pendulum just swing a little bit in the middle, you want it to swing a lot. And you have three variables you can work with. You can change the height at which you drop the pendulum. You could drop it from a very high height, a medium height, or a low height. You can change if you're using a short string, a medium string, or a long string. And you can change if you're using a lightweight, a medium weight and a heavy weight. And you have to try out these three different variables and all the possible permutations and combinations to try and figure out which is going to make the pendulum swing the widest. And finally, this can get us to even more complicated problem solving skills, such as cracking combination codes, like in the classic game of Mastermind, where you have to fix, find the combination of four possible colors, receiving feedback if you have a correct color in the correct position or a correct color in the incorrect position. Now, if you're interested in any of these problem solving ideas, whether it's the Riverboat problem, the Tower of Hanoi, Pendulum problem, or Mastermind, I actually talk about all of these in detail, including hints about the solutions in my Psych 200 Unit 8 Part 1 video on problem solving. So I encourage you uh, to look for that video if you're more interested in detail. For the purposes of this unit, just want to introduce you to the complex problems that we begin to solve. Marble Run is something we can begin to solve in the pre-operational thought stage, Riverboat and Tower Noi in the more concrete operational thought stage, and the Pendulum Problem Mastermind in the more formal operational thought stage, as they require more deductive reasoning and keeping track of the different combinations. Now, aside of this problem solving, another big skill that starts to come online is, of course, numeracy and literacy. This takes up so much energy when we're in school, and it's really important. It should. Numeracy is amazing. Math is magical and really cool. And we start to show a really good capacity for math pretty early on in the lifespan. 
early on in the preoperational thought stage when we're two or three we have really good number recognition and we start to identify two with two or three with three and we start to understand what these numbers mean this can grow as we start to see the numbers in different forms and we start to see things that are maybe not numerals, but we start to see patterns, whether it's patterns in geometric shapes, triangle square, triangle share, square, or stripes and polka dots, we start to understand patterns. And these patterns can help us to then combine our number recognition and our patterns to a skill known as seriation. The seriation is kind of putting things in a serial order. It's the idea of classification, not just classifying things based on color or shape now, but rank ordering things. So putting all the sticks in line from longest to shortest or finding the heaviest or the lightest. And this is a really important skill for us to have that we can only really get when we have a sense of quantity or have a number sense. We can say more or less. Once we get this idea of more or less down, we start to find these patterns in other ways. We might start to be able to count to 10 or count to 100. And we might note little patterns in a hundreds chart and see how you, everything might start with the same digit as you go across the horizontal rows or might end with the same digit as you go down the columns. This can prepare us to master things like place values and understanding how to count by tens or how to skip count by hundreds. And so understanding place values and understanding things like 59 is less than 61, even though there's a nine in the ones place in the, and one in the ones place in those two different numbers, understanding how to judge place values is very important. And finally, with numeracy, a big thing that we begin to master in the elementary years in the concrete operational stage is really our math operations. I like to think of concrete operational as when we can really do our math operations without counting on our fingers or doing props. In pre-operational, we might be able to add two and three, but we often do it with our fingers or do it with diagrams versus in concrete operational, now we just need the numerals. Now we can write two plus three, or we could even do simple math in our head. As we move on to the formal operational thought stage, well, this is really when we can do things like algebra, trigonometry, pre-calculus, and this is really when we start to think about math in even less concrete forms and much more abstract forms. Now, some of us will struggle with math more than others, and some individuals do have a learning disability known as dyscalculia. And this is the idea that they really struggle to visualize things like the number line or visualize things like the hundreds chart or understand what's going on in terms of number fluency and how numbers work together. And so this is a really important learning disorder to understand because it's not the same as another learning disorder we'll talk about in a bit. It's not the same as reversing numbers, but understanding a number sense and understanding how numbers work. And so this is, can be a really struggling point for a lot of people. Of course, another academic skill we need to talk about is the skill of literacy. And literacy starts off much earlier than you may expect. Our next unit, of course, is on linguistic development, so we'll talk about this in more detail then. But in terms of literacy as a cognitive skill, it really starts off with our oral comprehension, understanding instructions, you know, take your shoes off and wash your hands, understanding if someone watches a movie or tells a story, do you understand the gist of that movie or story? As oral comprehension improves, our, lit our vocabulary will improve and we'll start to understand the names of new animals and plants and vegetables and we'll assimilate that all to our mind. And as that starts to improve and we're exposed to more letters or what we call graphemes or written symbols, we will start to recognize those letters. And as we recognize those letters and as we see patterns in those letters, so it is connected to math too, as we see patterns in those letters, we will begin to decode. And decoding is really phonics. It's the A is for apple, Z is for zebra component. And eventually we can start to decode with contextual cues. We'll see pictures and we'll use the pictures as hints, but eventually we need less and less contextual cues to help us out. So literacy is really powerful. It's a major skill that helps predict our well-being and our well-adjustedness throughout life. But that being said, some individuals do have a learning disability known as dyslexia. And dyslexia is different than dyscalculia. What's often happening here is they are having a hard time understanding what's going on in a linguistic sense. And this can often happen where symbols are flipped. So we can see a lot of people may struggle with dyslexia because certain letters within a word are being flipped. So phonetically, they're having a hard time to pronounce it. We can also see dyslexia where individuals may flip numbers once in a while. They may see 53 as 35. And so there is that number flipping component. 
And so it's important to understand that this is a real learning disability that can cause a lot of struggle, but there have been lots of ways around it. Although lots of people like to make fun of Comic Sans font, it's important to understand Comic Sans font is fantastic for people with dyslexia because in that font, every letter is written slightly different. So none of the letters are mirror images of each other, and it actually makes reading with dyslexia much easier. Now we're moving along, we just have two additional cognitive abilities I want to talk about, and these are really high-end ones, ones that we really get to in the formal operational thought period. And one of them is abstract reasoning. Abstract reasoning is the idea you can begin to do things that are non-visual. This is the idea you can do math in your head, and not just simple 2 plus 3 math, but now you can think about functions. And now you can think about linear algebra in your head, you might not need to write it down. This is the idea you can think about things that are really improbable or irrational numbers, let's say. You can also think about word problems without writing them down. So let's say you have something like Alice is taller than Tom, Mark is shorter than Andy, Andy is shorter than Tom. Who is the tallest? And this is the idea that without writing that down and making a graph about it, can you listen to that and solve it in your head? Or for instance, if we say a train is leaving here going at this speed at this hour and trains leaving in this direction going at this speed at this hour, can you solve that just with math, just with physics without having to write down and make an elaborate diagram? And so this is really focusing on things that you can't touch. So a lot of abstract reasoning could be visualizing the improbable, visualizing things nobody has visualized before. And this could help us with sorting things like in the height problem. It also requires a lot of inhibition so you can stop and think about things all the way through and you don't just jump to it. It involves a lot of working memory and it involves a lot of planning to solve this. But this is important. This is things that we need when we think about science, when we think about you know, making a shuttle go to the moon and we have to think about orbits and we have to think about the space and the rotation and how all that sort of stuff plays out. Yes, today we can make computer models that could help us to visualize that, but the very first people didn't have those really elaborate models. They had to think abstractly in order to construct the models. And this is something we don't just use in science, but we can use in religion as well. When you think about the sense of what comes after, or if there is an afterlife, or how the universe started, or what is the meaning of life, this type of big thinking abstract reasoning is needed. So this is really intense stuff that some of us don't feel comfortable doing, some of us are not abstract thinkers, and not all of us feel really comfortable in this cognitive skill set. The final skill set may be even more tricky, and this is hypothetical thinking. So this is how we make knowledge. How do we even move forward and think about new possibilities? This often involves suspending our sense of reality. This is the idea of we said, imagine if a feather could break glass. If a feather could break glass, what would happen if I tapped a glass with a feather? This is using an if-then statement, and the if statement usually is something that violates our sense of reality. What happens if we ask this to a child in the concrete operational stage? They may say, nothing's going to happen if you tap a glass with a feather, it's not going to break, I don't, and they, they, they disallow the if statement. Versus a person in the formal operational thought period will try and follow it through. They'll say, well, I guess if a feather could break glass, and you tap a glass with a feather, it'll break. But then if they're trying to extrapolate that, you know, what, what would happen to our world if all of a sudden feathers could break glass? Think about all the birds that fly into windshields and fly into your windows. Well, now they would shatter the windows. That would be really interesting. Or let's say hypothetically you ask someone, imagine a world where instead of metal being mag magnetic, wood was magnetic. What would change about our world? Some of us, that's mind blowing. We can't even go there. We don't want to go there. That hurts our brain to think about it. Some of us might say, well, computers would have to run differently. Generators would have to have wood blocks in them instead of metal blocks. The way we construct our house would be different. Um, Magneto from X-Men would have different powers. And so you would be able to think more hypothetically. This hypothetical thinking helps us to think about the impossible. It helps us to think about things that we can never really know, like infinity or impossible numbers. And it can help us to think about what could happen someday. If you think about aliens, most of the time when we depict aliens, it's not really using hypothetical thinking. It's using android-like figures or deep sea-like figures or something like something we know because we have a hard time breaking out and considering the unknown. So when researchers actually contemplate what life on other planets may be like, they're using this hypothetical thinking. 
And so hypothetical thinking is really considered to be the top and how we even ponder how to create new knowledge or how to know about knowing or how to investigate how to create knowledge. So it's really the top level. Now this unit did not contain every cognitive skill possible, but I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough of these different cognitive skills and how they develop over the lifespan. Keep in mind that some of the earlier skills like object permanence and symbolism tend to be pretty mastered pretty early on versus other things like egocentrism and theory of mind we tend to master around age five, problem solving, literacy, and numeracy we get a good handle on in middle school versus abstract reasoning and hypothetical thoughts are things that we strive after for the whole lifespan. You've now reached the end of Unit 5 on Cognitive Development. I hope you enjoyed it.